Let's go and talk about one of your competitors, uh, Nigel Farage from Reform UK, uh, who says mass deportations of illegal immigrants is a political impossibility, even though Trump, who he admires, doesn't think so. What do you make of this story? Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. So Stephen Edgington, who's doing fantastic work, I must point out, he is one of the best journalists in British politics at the moment. Uh, he sat down with Nigel Farage and the interview was released yesterday. And in it, he posed the question, do you support the mass deportations of illegal immigrants? As, we, as you know, for the past few years, we've had this small boats crisis where we've had tens of thousands, but obviously cumulatively, cumulatively over the years, it's now in the hundreds of thousands of unauthorised crossings into our country. Um, so these people are not supposed to be here. The public certainly don't want them here. It's a public safety risk. But Farage doesn't support the premise that they should be mass deported, which is absolutely incredible because reform positions itself as the radical party to stop uh, you know, many of the insanities that we see with how Labour and Tory govern. And yet a basic premise like we should de be deporting illegal people that don't belong here, he says it's an impossibility, which is a total joke. Uh, Donald Trump, who he, someone who he admires, has said that he will, in his next administration, be conducting mass deportations. There's huge precedent for this, right? In the 1950s, Farage even pointed this out in the interview, they were deporting millions of illegal immigrants. And in fact, uh, Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, again, another notorious figure who deported lots and lots and lots of illegal immigrants. But Farage says it's a political impossibility. What's strange about this, in my view, Alec, is most people who voted for reform would have assumed he'd say it's a political imperative to do this. Um, when I was a member of parliament, I became very acutely aware of the, the pressure of being in the establishment, which is parliament. Is it possible that Nigel Farage is being poisoned by this intense immersion in one of the longest standing institutions in Britain? Quite possibly. However, I would say his rhetoric is becoming a lot softer as the years have gone by. I remember distinctly a decade ago, Mr. Farage used to go on Question Time and speak about how uh, people feel uncomfortable at just having foreigners speaking a foreign language on public transport, you know. Um, now this guy ca can't even bring himself to say that he's um, concerned about the decline of the indigenous British population. That was another question put to him by Stephen Edgerton. Are you concerned that the white British population are dramatically and rapidly becoming an ever increasingly smaller number and indeed reduced to a minority in many cities, including London, Birmingham, etc.? And he says, no, it's not an issue. Um, so I yep. think he's becoming a lot weaker even before he stepped into parliament. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're actually going to have Ben Habib, who was one of the most senior uh, Reform UK activists, and also Anne Whittacombe, who is one of the most eloquent Reform UK uh, representatives in the second hour of my show today. And I'm going to put this to, to them, because the obvious question is, why is mass deportation an impossibility? Everything's possible. Uh, if, if you can take... Um, money from 10 million pensioners and give it to Vladimir Zelensky, anything's possible. Uh, so we'll carry on uh, with that question. A couple of other things. So Turkish parents forced from small boats plead to join children taken to UK without them. That's a creative way to get into the UK. Why don't we send the children back? I, I mean, I just want to say it's an absolutely incredible story, right? These are people coming from Turkey, Right. Turkey, yes, it has a history of discriminating against its uh, Kurdish ethnic minorities. However, it, this is not a third world nation. It's a NATO member. It's, a, it's an aspiring EU member. And if these people are genuine refugees, they should have gone to the next neighbouring country. But instead, they've taken this awfully dangerous route to Great Britain with their children aged five and nine. And now we've got this situation where they've become separated. And yeah. we all know that, that a story <clears throat> like this is supposed to tug on our heartstrings, right, to guilt trip us into accepting the premise 
of as of you know mass asylum um and and it's outrageous because we've got our own problems at home you know and talk of discrimination we can see the fierce discrimination against our own people just look at how Keir Starmer responded to the riots basically just labeling all ordinary working class english people as far right and racist because they're outraged about the two tier justice system that we have you could go to prison for that if the G20 meeting in Brazil uh, strengthens its position on misinformation. Uh, that's the other story which we've noticed. Uh, what is misinformation? Presumably what they're going to do is they're going to ban anyone uh, and, and arrest anyone who claims it's a climate emergency. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's ideological. It's not about objectively trying to clamp down on genuine misinformation, because of course, the internet is a free for all, you're going to have people yeah. being inaccurate, or even spreading lies to further their own agenda. But this is always, it's about clamping down on political dissent, people that have a different view from the politicians, or indeed go against the vested interests of their uh, donors. Uh, that's what this is all about. Uh, it's not about promoting a culture of having more accurate information in the world. So it's completely cynical. Uh, misinformation has been politicized, uh, in my view. Uh, do you think that we are actually on the precipice of an Orwellian 1984? <sighs> Well, I think there's just a tug of war going on, isn't there? A, a few years ago, who would have seen that Elon Musk would have bought, twi uh, bought Twitter and, you know, made it so that you have a lot more freedom of speech? Um, some of the conversations that are going on now, we wouldn't have thought imaginable five years ago because of the climate we were under. Um, so I think there is, there is a battle going on between different competing elite factions and if you care about uh, open internet um, and, you know, people being able to speak freely politically, um, then we have to hope that uh, the team that advocates freedom of speech and open dialogue wins out in that battle. The good news, of course, is with David Lammy as Foreign Secretary, it means that uh, people who aren't educated and aren't very smart still have a chance of getting the top jobs. Thanks very much indeed, Alec Cave. Uh, we'll see you again. Thank you for your erudition and keep fighting. Don't give up. Don't give up the cause.